So we concluded last lecture with a piece of, of good news. So we had this, we've moved on to this Mazda evaluation case. Welfare maximizations is be hard, but we can get decent uh, approximation algorithms in polynomial time if we ignore incentives completely. So now, of course, what we want to do is we want to say, okay, well, we want just as good an incentive, we want just as good a performance guarantee and computational tractability guarantee, but now we want strong incentive guarantees also, okay? Ideally, DSIC. So how to extend the two approximation for scenario number six to a DSIC mechanism. Okay, so this, is, uh, this turns out to be a lot harder than it might first appear, actually. And I'm not going to give you any positive results for, for sort of this question today. We'll return, we'll circle back to it next week after we've expanded our toolbox. Okay, so what I want to do next is I want to um, look at a couple other scenarios which, where it's sort of a, a bit easier to get positive results. And those other scenarios will also motivate new tools for designing mechanisms that have good approximation guarantees. And then finally, we'll go back to at least a subcase of the submodular case and apply those tools to get some positive results uh, there. Okay, so first let me just make sort of some high level comments just about kind of the nature of the challenges uh, in doing this question. So first, let's just say, you know, for those of you who took 364A last quarter, you know, we've been here before, actually, and it seemed fine at the time. So uh, the case study that I used in 364A was knapsack, and we had this notion, we had Meyerson's lemma, and Meyerson's lemma, what it did is it told us exactly which allocation rules could be used in DSIC mechanisms. And it was very nice, it was exactly the monotone allocation rules. And so, you know, we had knapsack, MP hard problem. Uh, you can get a one minus epsilon approximation in polynomial time, so that was good. But then when we inspected the corresponding allocation rule, we observed it wasn't monotone, so it wasn't suitable for a DSIC mechanism. But, you know, we actually, well, you tweaked it a little bit because it was a homework problem, and uh, showed that it could be, uh, you know, redesigned to be monotone and still be a one minus epsilon approximation, and, you know, then we got a DSIC mechanism. Okay, so it's sort of a total happy ending, right? So it required a little bit of algorithmic work, but we got exactly the conclusion that we wanted. So the first thing you might think about is like, well, wh why don't we just go through exactly that same exercise here? Right, we design the approximation algorithm, check if it's monotone, if it's not monotone, we sort of tweak it so it's monotone, and we're off to the races. So idea number one, so first of all, let me emphasize that Meyerson's lemma, as stated last quarter, was only for single parameter problems. Actually, if you think about it, the statement only makes sense for single parameter problems. What did it say? What does it mean for allocation rule to be monotone? It says, the more you bid, the higher you bid, the more stuff you get. Okay? And if you're bidding, if, if it's multi-parameter, right, if there's all these different bundles you're bidding on simultaneously, it's not even clear what to say, the more you bid. Right? What if you raise a bid on one bundle and decrease it on another one? Okay? Well, what, what do you call that? So, but we could hope to have an analog of Meyerson's lemma. That works. So idea number one, identify a monotonicity condition that characterizes implementability. Characterizes DSIC implementability. So just to remind you, what does it mean to be implementable? That means I hand you an allocation rule. And the question is, is there or is there not a payment rule when coupled with this allocation rule gives you a DSIC mechanism? If there is, it's implementable. If there's no such payment rule, it's not implementable. And what we proved last quarter is that monotonicity is exactly the same thing as implementable. So, maybe there's an analog here. So actually there is. There's something called cyclic monotonicity. And, uh, so, you know, so while there is a characterization of implementable allocation rules, it's just you got, you got to take, my, take this on faith for now. It's just not that useful. Okay? So what do I mean it's not that? So that said, we will actually use it once in this class, I'm pretty sure, in a couple of weeks. But so what do I mean by not useful? First of all, it's just hard to check. Given an allocation rule, it's just hard to figure out whether or not it satisfies this property. Whereas monotonicity often is not very hard to figure out whether or not it's satisfied or not. But two, it almost never holds. And we'll see more evidence of this as we go through the lecture today. Okay, so just rarely, can, if you come up with something and you check this condition, it's just almost always false. Right? Is it a sufficient condition for implementability? It's necessary and sufficient, actually. Yep. I 
hard to check, do you mean testing-wise? Uh, so I just mean, uh, like, say you take your favorite approximation algorithm and just ask the question, does it satisfy this condition or not? That's, the, um, as a math problem, it's annoyingly time-consuming, usually. More so than in the single parameter case. Plus, the other point is there tends to be just no payoff at the end. Usually the answer is no. So usually you work hard to prove that actually your algorithm is not suitable. So I don't really advocate going this direction, is what I'm trying to say. Right? So this kind of way of thinking about mechani approximate mechanism design that was fruitful in the single parameter world, by and large, has not been fruitful for researchers in the multi-parameter world. Okay? So we're going to think about it a little bit differently. Um, OK, so idea number two. So more, the way we're going to think about it is we're going to just start from what we already know works, right? and then just try to make it slightly more powerful one step at a time. Add bells and whistles. Okay, So kind of start bottom up. Okay? And so for example, the VCG mechanism we know, is, we know works, okay, is DSIC. It may not be polynomial time in the cases we're now looking at, but at least it gets the incentives right. So idea number two would be, okay, well, we've got the VCG mechanism. If it's NP-hard, we can't implement it in polynomial time. But if we have an approximation algorithm that does run in polynomial time, let's just stick that in instead. Okay? So if you think about it, the VCG mechanism, you, you can define an analog with respect to any allocation rule, like our two approximation for welfare maximization. You get valuations from people, you invoke your approximation algorithm to compute an approximately optimal allocation, and then to compute the payments, you just invoke it n more times. Okay? You delete a bidder, you, do the, you use your approximation algorithm again, and then that defines the payments. Mm -hmm. Does that necessarily give you non-negative payments? Uh, so no, it does not, among other problems. Um, right, so that's going to be sort of the least of our problems at the moment. Well, I mean, actually, frankly, in some applications, it's the most of your problems. But um, let me just say the following. So plug approximation algorithm into VCG. And let me just say the problem here, and again, this, so this is an attempt, so just as far as like how we're approaching the problem, this is a different angle, right? So rather than kind of you know, have a necessary and sufficient condition which tells us what the whole design space looks like, we're just starting from something we know works and trying to extend it. The problem is this way of extending what we know works uh, almost never succeeds. And for now, the main thing I just want to um, say by never works is you will get a mechanism in general which is not DSIC. Okay. And um, this I can sort of tell you morally why this shouldn't work, what the problem is. Okay, actually, there, there's some good intuition for why this, this is going to fail. So let's remember what the point of the VCG payments were. Okay, so you're charged your externality, so basically the surplus loss that others incur because of your presence. And the reason we're charging externalities is because if you, look, if you then look at the utility of a bidder, its value minus its payment, its payment is then up to a, con up to a constant, the negative of other people's welfare in the outcome. So in other words, the payments are defined so that it aligns your own utility with the social welfare of everybody. Okay, that's why the VCG mechanism works morally. So intuition, by design, VCG aligns the utility of a bidder with the social welfare, up to some constant term which the bidder can't influence. So for incentives, it's irrelevant, okay? So this is just, uh, this is just how the, I mean, the VCG payments are defined so that this is true. So in the happy case where you're maximizing welfare exactly, well, the bidder wants to make its utility as high as possible, and so that means it just wants the social welfare to be as high as possible. So if the mechanism does this, then the bidder's gonna be happy. Now, if the mechanism fails to maximize the social welfare, if it does something suboptimal, that corresponds to an opportunity, potentially, of a bidder to misreport in a way that coaxes the approximation algorithm to actually spit out a strictly better solution, resulting in a strictly bigger utility for that bidder. Okay? So suboptimality in the allocation rule kind of directly represent opportunities to misreport 
to have better, to have higher welfare allocations, therefore higher bidder utilities. So that's why fundamentally approximation algorithms just almost never work if you just plug them into the VCG mechanism with the VCG payments. Okay. So again, if right hand side suboptimal, uh, there exists opportunity for some bidder to increase utility. Now, uh, you know, this is, this is sort of morally true. Technically, the reason this is, uh, you know, a little, you know, not really the complete story is because um, it's not clear that a bidder has a unilateral way of coaxing the allocation rule into a better allocation, okay? But actually, this can be dealt with. So there's a paper of, of Nissan and Ronin, I'll put the citation in the notes, who prove that this really is true. I mean, really, basically, if you're doing something suboptimal, VCG payments just sort of basically never work. Okay, there is a theorem that says exactly that. Okay, and so the, an important thing I, I want you to take away from this discussion, and this will become clear throughout the rest of today and next week, um, is that for multi-parameter problems, so there's a big difference between single-parameter mechanism design problems and multi-parameter design problems, really very big as far as both how well we understand it, but seemingly what is even possible versus impossible. Okay? So for mo with the single parameter case being much, much easier, it seems. So for multi-parameter problems, like the common trail auctions we've been talking about, the bottom line is, is if you insist on dominant strategy and center compatibility, it just seems there is very little you can do. Okay, the design space is just very meager. Okay. That said, we'll work hard today and next week to do the best we can in this very limited design space, but it seems very limited indeed. And then in the entire second half of the class, motivated by this sort of moral, we're going to relax the DSIC requirements so that we can actually get a bigger design space and more positive results. Okay. Good. Oh, and I should say, um, so this, as a, as a mathematical statement, this is more conjecture than proof at this point. There are theorems around this. So you could actually, you could imagine a theorem that actually said the space, you know, the only multi-parameter DSIC mechanisms are X, where X is some small set. And there is something called Robert's theorem, which basically says if you have a totally abstract problem, okay, so literally just some abstract outcome space, you don't have a notion of goods, nothing like that, then in fact you can actually prove that the only deterministic DSIC mechanisms are minor variants on the VCG mechanism. Okay, so that's known as Robert's theorem. Uh, so a, basically an open question is, does Robert's theorem hold for combinatorial auctions? Combinatorial auctions have some extra structure. You have these goods, and like, I only care about what items I get. I don't care about what items you get. Okay, so there's quote, no externalities between bidders in that sense. So that's extra structure in combinatorial auctions, which seems to, on the one hand, make it really difficult to prove theorems like Robert's theorem, but on the other hand, doesn't seem to be enough structure to enable non-trivial DSIC mechanisms. So that's kind of the state of the art at the moment. It's kind of hard to prove positive or negative results for combinatorial auctions. Okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, tell you in these couple of weeks what, what we have been able to prove. All right, so any questions? All right, so here's the plan. So again, the, uh, the plan is to just start from what we know works, which at the moment is pretty much just the VCG mechanism, and look at bells and whistles of it, look at variations, and look at some problems where that'll give us non-trivial results, okay? And so today I want to introduce a couple more scenarios. Uh, one will be simple and we'll solve completely. One is more complicated and we'll spill over into next week. And the tools we develop we'll put to use in the submodular case next week. So beyond VCG, what else could you do? So here's idea number one. It's a very kind of minor idea, but it's useful in some cases. So let me tell you about maximal and range mechanisms. So ma maximal and range, MIR, this is a property of an allocation rule. Okay? So uh, MIR allocation rule has the following structure. So what you do, okay, so say there's, a, say there's an outcome space. I'm going to describe this abstractly, but you can go ahead and think about combinatorial options. 
So there's an outcome space omega. So this would be like all allocations in the problem we've been discussing. And um, this rule then pre-commits before it ever sees valuations, before it ever sees bids by the players. It says up front, look, okay, I'm only ever going to output an outcome in a subset omega prime. All right, now why would you ever do this? So here's, here's what you want to have in mind. You want to think about omega as being either too big or too unstructured to optimize over efficiently. Okay, so searching over omega is a hard problem. Omega prime is going to be chosen to be either small or structured enough so that searching over it's an easy problem. Okay, so think of omega prime as a subset which is tractable. Okay, so you're losing information but hopefully gaining tractability and passing to omega prime. And then once the bids or valuations come in, X just runs VCG on omega prime. Okay? So it's a very minor extension of ECG. Okay, up front, I throw out some outcomes and I run VCG on what's left. Okay, and the hope is that you can find a sweet spot, an omega prime that's rich enough that you haven't, you know, you can still get a good approximation, right? You've thrown out some stuff, but the hope is you still have kind of something near optimal for any valuations, but it's also small or structured enough that you can optimize efficiently. Okay? And this is clearly D sick just because VCG is d -sick. Omega prime could well have been the original outcome space for all anybody cared, all anybody knew, okay? So that's an MIR mechanism or allocation rule. So as far as what else could you do other than VCG? Well, you know, this is something you could do. All right, so could it ever be useful for anything, okay? Well, it's not useful that often, but once in a while. So let me show you an example. How you might, how you can actually do this to get a, a somewhat interesting result. So let me give you a generalization. So we're going to go back to the world of identical items. So identical items is before we were talking about downward sloping valuations. We had Ozabel's clinching auction, blah, 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 blah. So we're going to look at a harder version of that where we drop the downward sloping assumption. Okay, so remember, this is where all the items are the same. And as a bidder, you might want more than one. You're not unit demand. Downward sloping said each additional unit gave you only less marginal value. Now we're going to drop that assumption. Okay? So uh, extra units may give you more or less marginal value than the previous one. Non-negative marginal value, you have free disposal as usual. Okay, but that's the only assumption. All right, so M identical items. I has marginal values, mu i j, non-negative, for all j. And again, the key point here is need not be downward sloping. Downward sloping, you'll recall we had a nice ascending auction, and we basically got everything we wanted. Okay? All right. So let me tell you what we can do just with the regular VCG mechanism, and then I'll explain how we can get sort of an incomparable result using an MIR mechanism. Incomparable meaning it'll be faster, but it will be approximate instead of exact. So I'll leave it as an exercise to convince yourself that you can solve this exactly using dynamic programming. Uh, it's not that different than, say, knapsack or something like that. In fact, if you think about it, um, knapsack is going to be a special case of this problem. Okay, so basically, if your marginal values are just 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then at some, some point it kicks up to some number, you know, 10, and then the marginal values after that are like 0, 0, 0, 0, that's like, you know, if, say, it was the 12th good that gave you this marginal value of 10, that's like a knapsack item with size 12 and value 10. Right, you give it 12 items, you get value 10. Your knapsack capacity is like M. Okay? So it's a little bit more general than knapsack, but dynamic programming, again, works fine. So exercise. Can maximize welfare in time polynomial in N and M. Uh, 
by dynamic programming. And of course, if the valuations are represented explicitly, if you're just given a list of these mu ij's, then, you know, you'd be happy with this. On the other hand, you know, dynamic programming for the knapsack problem, we usually think of that as pseudo-polynomial, right? Usually running time linear in the knapsack, so, so m here corresponds to the knapsack capacity in a knapsack problem. And if you run in time linear in the knapsack capacity, we usually think of that as only pseudo-polynomial and not truly polynomial. And so you might want to think here, you might want to look for algorithms that actually are polynomial in n and log m, right? The number of bits needed to explain what the supply is. Now, you have these marginal values, right? So again, you need some model for that, but we've already talked about that. So let's think actually about a black box model for valuations that supports value queries. Okay, so for a bitter eye, I'm just going to say, look, what if I gave you 17 items? What would you pay for it? Okay, and they'll answer us, all right? And then we're, other than that, we're not going to treat them as part of the input. Okay, they just answer value queries. Then it's conceivable we could get a running time that had sublinear dependence on it. So, and we can, that's what I'm going to show you next. So this is by Dobzinski and Nissan. Um, so there exists a maximal in range algorithm or mechanism with two properties. So first of all, it's not going to be exact, but we'll get at least 50% of the opt welfare. And two, the time plus the number of value queries is uh, polynomial in n and log m. And I guess I should also write um, log of the biggest number, probably. Okay. So again, the, the point here, so this is worse, it's only an approximation, this is better. Okay. The running time, allow accounting value queries is constant time. is polynomial in the log of m, not an m. Okay? So if m is huge, this is a big win, actually. All right. All right, but again, the main reason I'm showing you this is just to convince you that, you know, MIR, as modest and as advanced as it sounds and is, you know, can be useful in some contexts. Okay, that's the point of this example. All right, so any questions before, the proof is not, we'll be able to do the proof pretty quick, it's not hard. Any questions before that? All right, All right so, so if it's MIR, I need to tell you what is this outcome space, right? So an allocation space. So basically, an MIR algorithm is going to say, look, I will only ever output allocations with certain special properties. Right, so I need to tell you what those special properties are. So here's what it is. So what I'm going to do is just up front, I'm going to take these M items, conceptually at least, and I'm going to split them into blocks, chunks, okay? So I started with M items. I only want there to be kind of N squared meta items. Okay, I, I'm okay being polynomial on n. I don't want to be polynomial on m. I want to be sub, I want to be logarithmic in m. So I start with m. I want to squeeze it down to just n squared, which means each block has m over n squared items in it. And I'm only going to optimize over allocations where I dole out items in these blocks of m over n squared at a time. Okay, so your allocation will be some integer multiple of m over n squared. That's omega prime. So this is now just a multi-unit auction, in effect, with n squared items, where each of these n squared items represents m over n squared in the original one, okay? So, you know, now that there's so few items, right, so now that the number of items is just n squared, I can run the dynamic programming algorithm on these meta items and maximize welfare over all this entire restricted allocation space, omega prime. The only reason I have dependence on, law, on m at all is because I need to actually, you know, write down the quantity when I query a value, uh, when I do a value query to one of these black box valuations. Okay, so I might have to ask it about a number as large as m, so I need log m time to do that. Right? So, so it can be done via DP in poly n log m 
time plus value queries. Okay. So, you know, I did choose omega prime small enough that it enabled fast search. Okay, so that's, that's good. But now the question is, did I throw out the baby with the bathwater? Okay, are there still enough allocations in there so I can always get a good approximation? Okay, so that's what I have to prove. All right. So, let me show that to you. So suppose the optimal allocation is S1 star up to Sn star. Now all the goods are identical, so I mean really these are just non-negative integers that sum to m, okay? So suppose that's the optimal allocation. What I need to show is that there exists an allocation in omega prime, that is an allocation that only uses these blocks of m over n squared size, that is almost as good as this one. Why is that enough? Well, because amongst all of those allocations, we're gonna pick the best one. Okay, so if I show you one good one, we're done. So I need to show there exists some allocation S1 up to Sn of blocks so that the welfare that you get from it is at least one half of the optimal welfare. Agreed? Okay. So this is easy enough. Two cases. So first, if there's a, if, you know, if um, in this optimal allocation, it turns out almost all of the welfare, say at least half the welfare in here, comes from a single bidder, no problem. Because right, one of our feasible allocations is just to give everything to one bidder. Okay? So that's one of the things we optimize over. So if there's one bidder in here which contributes half of the welfare, no problem. And then we just set SI equals to be all M. Nobody else gets anything. And then uh, done. Okay, so I'm using monotonicity here. I'm using that the mu's are non-negative. Okay? So in this allocation, the key bitter I is as happy as before. We lose everybody else. Sorry. One half there. We lose perhaps everybody else, but they were only contributing at most half the welfare, so no big deal. Okay. We're a factor two approximation. So, what if that's not the case? This is slightly more interesting. So suppose no bidder contributes half of the welfare or more in the optimal allocation. Basically what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to sort of start from the optimal allocation. All right, so what's the issue, right? So the issue is in the optimal allocation, right? So say m over n squared is like 100. Okay, so I'm only allocating in multiples of 100. The issue is that, you know, in, in this optimal allocation, right, this guy might have like 101 items, okay? And moreover, maybe his marginal value was like zero for the first 100, and it was that magic 101th item that gave him all of its value, right? So that means if I want to allocate it anything, if I want to get any value from that guy, I have to round up to the nearest multiple, okay? I can't give it 101 goods, I have to give it 200, because those are the multiples that I'm allocating in. So what I'm going to do, well, I'm just, so I basically want to top people off, okay? Because then I'll get their value. But obviously I can't, you know, round everybody up, because I only have these M goods to work with. So there'll just be some sacrificial lamb, okay, some bidder. I'll take all its items away from them, and I'll use that to round everybody else up, okay? And, okay, so why is there somebody that has so many items that I can actually round up everybody else? Well, this is the magic N squared number. Right, so there's n squared blocks floating around. There's n bidders. So somebody's got n of them. Okay? So that's my sacrificial lamb. Right? I take his n blocks. I basically just, that, that's enough. That's a proof of concept that I can round everybody else up and just round this one guy down. Why don't I lose all of the welfare by rounding this one guy down? Well, in case two, nobody has that much of the welfare. No single bidder contributes half the welfare or more. Okay? All right, so... I feel like I should write something. Um, so case two. Otherwise, there exists I with at least N blocks. And so then how do I set my new allocation? 
So for k naught equal to i, so si equals s star i rounded up to multiple of m over n squared. So that is, I give this guy the fewest number of blocks so that it gets at least as much as it gets in the optimal allocation. And then i gets the rest. Or nothing, it doesn't really matter. And then what do we have? We have sum over the welfare and our allocation. Well, I, I was our sacrificial lamb, so we'll just lower bound that person by zero. But for everybody else, they get at least as many, at least as much quantity in our allocation than the optimal one. So by monotonicity, we pick up all of their values by the assumption of case two. This is at least half of the full welfare in the optimal solution. Okay. So that's that. So that's an example use of a maximal and range mechanism. Any questions about that? Do we know if the one half is tight? Good question, good question. So for this mechanism, certainly, that's not hard to show, just with two, just with two bidders. So here's what's cool. There's actually a cool story about multi-unit auctions, which is one of the reasons why I bothered to spend some time on it. So for deterministic mechanisms, it is unknown whether you can beat two with d sick or not. It's actually quite a nice open question. What is known is that if you restrict attention to d sick mechanisms that always allocate all m items, then you cannot beat a factor two. What is unknown is whether there's a mechanism, deterministic d sick mechanism, that may or may not allocate everything and always beats two. Open, good open question. Interesting. Open, so like definitely. You know, if you wanted to spend a lot of your project time thinking about an open question, that would be a good one to do. Very appropriate. Randomized, and this, this is a project um, topic, looking about these papers. With randomized, you actually can get uh, 1 minus epsilon. And it's going to be the same. So I'm about to pass to sort of a randomized generalization of maximum range. And I won't actually show you this proof, although it is a project. Um, one of these randomized versions of maximal and range, very cleverly designed by a PhD student of mine here a few years ago, uh, and one co-author, shows you can get one minus epsilon. So that's very cool. And again, the, the, in the same kind of poly and n and log n with value queries. So there, the statement is, you're still, you're randomizing, so, but it's still d-sick. It's d-sick, assuming risk neutral bitters. Assuming risk neutrality. Yeah, yeah. And then you get an expected one minus epsilon fraction. Um, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, yeah, you get expected, your expected welfare is one minus epsilon. There are some mechanisms out there with the approximations with probability one, and the expectation is only over the incentives, but this is not one of them. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is scenario seven is, is actually a nice challenge problem. Uh, so, I mean, the downward sloping case is already very interesting on the tractable side, and this general case is a quite interesting example on the intractable side. Okay, good. Any other questions? All right. Then, as promised, you know, so again, we're, 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 trying, we're trying to rack our brains and thinking about what could possibly, what, what could d -sick mechanisms look like for multi-parameter problems? And we're just starting from what we know and taking baby steps. And so let me show you one of the baby step, and actually this little baby step will get us basically to the state of the art. I'm sort of embarrassed to tell you, okay? And so this is nothing more than a randomized variation of maximal in range, okay? So maximal in distributional, it's kind of a painful name, range. So MIDR is now what we have. Okay, and I, I need to warn you, um, so first of all, this is gonna be kind of abstract, and second of all, I won't have time today to give you an actual example of one of these mechanisms. So I want, I'm gonna do the definition now anyways. I'll introduce you to the problem that we're going to solve using these mechanisms, but I won't have time today to give you that mechanism for that problem. Okay, so just forward pointer to what's gonna be next week, where, we, where we're gonna pick back up next week. All right, but the idea is simple enough. It just says, okay, instead of pre-committing to 
a subset of outcomes, we're going to allow lotteries over outcomes, randomizations over outcomes, okay? distributions. So again, before you ever see any valuations, what the allocation rule or the mechanism has to do is pre-commit to a set D. Uh, it doesn't have to be countable, but I'll write this anyways. Um, of distributions over omega. So, you know, one of these distributions might be as simple as, you know, with 50% probability, I do this first allocation. With 50% probability, I do this other allocation. Or even just like, you know, with 1% probability, I, you know, cancel the allocation completely. Those would be examples of distributions over outcomes. Okay? Okay, so, and again, so, so maximal and range would just correspond to the case where each of these was a point mass on a single outcome. Right, that would be that special case over omega, good. Um, and again, so let me remind you, so why do this, okay? So over here, hopefully it was sort of clear the role of MIR over here, which is the search space for the original problem was big and we just compressed it so that it was small. So we could basically kind of search it more or less exhaustively. Now here in general, the set of distributions need not be small relative to omega, it might be infinite. <laughs> But, you know, we know lots of examples where sort of enlarging the search space also makes stuff more tractable, right? Just think of integer and linear programs, right? Integer programs can be hard. You go to linear programs, it's not that there's fewer solutions, but it's somehow very nicely structured and enables efficient optimization. So something similar, that's a similar reason why distributions can sort of add tractability relative to the omega that you started with, okay? Okay, anyways, so those are some things you might want to think about. Now, what, is, what, is, what does the allocation rule have to do? Well, in the same way that amongst all of the omega primes, the allocation rule has to pick the best one. Remember, that's what VCG does. You tell it what it wants, and it picks the best option. Here, it just said up front, omega prime are the set of all the options. And again, best option means welfare maximizing with respect to the reported valuations. Same thing has to be true here. Amongst all the distributions, okay, once you know what people actually want, once you know the alleged valuations, you have to pick the best, okay, not outcome, distribution. So now the question is, okay, so how do you measure the quality of a distribution? Well, just by its expected welfare. Okay, so it's 50-50 over these two allocations, and you get these valuations, and the welfare would be 10 in this case and 20 in this other case. So you just say, okay, well, we'll treat it as 15. And if there's this other distribution over outcomes that randomizes between, you know, 10, 20, and 30, for expected welfare 20, we treat that as better. Okay, so when we compare distributions, we do it before we sample from them. Okay, we just think, okay, just look at the expected welfare under this distribution, given the alleged valuations, and pick the one that's the highest, okay? So that's, by definition, what an MIDR rule has to do, okay? So in other words, once you tell me the distributions, the rest of the rule is completely uniquely defined, okay? So, given, so it is, at the end of the day, gonna be a randomized allocation rule and so what does it do? So it chooses D star to maximize the expected welfare so let me just write this sort of totally abstractly so here you should think of omega as just being like an allocation. Okay, so there's just some outcome space. Uh, little omega is some outcome, like an allocation. And this is just the expected welfare for the outcome omega. And capital D is just some distribution over outcomes. So here, omega is sampled from D. Okay. So you have no choice in the MIDR rule. You have to pick the distribution that gives you the maximum expected welfare. These, of course, are the reported valuations. Um, and then, of course, at the end of the day, it's a mechanism. You have to do something. So you sample from the distribution that you picked. Okay. So you output omega prime sampled from uh, the best distribution, D star. So that, by definition, is a MIDR allocation rule. 
Okay. And so again, given the choice of the distributions, everything else is uniquely defined. Okay. So the only free parameter here, the only design parameter, what are these distributions? And again, I apologize, I won't give you an example today. I will next week. Okay, and so now um, this is one of the very few non-optional exercises. Just because I think it's something that would be just, it just makes so much more sense for kind of you to do the quick computation than the, me to do it in lecture, which is that, you know, this still works for DSIC mechanisms. Okay, there's an analog of VCG payments, where again, you sort of say, okay, we know what the expected welfare is if bidder I is in the system, and we know the expected welfare of the other bidders in that case. If we deleted bidder I, we could recompute, we could rechoose the best distribution just for the other people, look at their expected welfare, we look at that difference, we could charge that as a payment, and the claim is that payment rule coupled with this randomized allocation rule gives you the dominant strategy and set of compatibility. Okay, so then you're, I'm paying based on these expected quantities, but what I actually get is randomized. You can do it either way, actually. It's a good question. So the, the simplest, the, fir uh, so the first way to think about it is exactly what you're thinking about it. So the question is basically, is the payment rule randomized or not? That's kind of roughly what the question is, right? So the allocation rule is certainly randomized, right? So I'll, sometimes I'll get nothing, sometimes I'll get like this really juicy bundle of goods. And then I'm just, but I'm only thinking about my expected welfare. And you can implement it either way. Either I could just pay some fixed number Right, so like I tell you my valuation, I always pay $100. Sometimes I pay $100 for nothing. Sometimes I pay $100 for a ton of stuff. So that would violate what's called ex post individual rationality. Okay, sometimes I'll pay $100 and it gets zero. So I actually have negative utility in some cases. Sort of the simplest implementation of the mechanism has that property. There's an extra trick, maybe I'll talk about it next week. Uh, it's, I'll see if it fits. There's an extra trick where you can actually um, compute the payments in a way that you have ex post individual rationality. So you can couple the randomness in the allocation and the payment rules if you want, uh, so that you have that. And then of course, for the DSIC condition, we're just thinking about players as uh, optimizing over expectations. So if you don't change the expectations, it doesn't matter for the incentive compatibility. So I wasn't planning on talking about that today, but you, you can get the ex post individual rationality if you want. So exercise, so if F X is MIDR, and P equals, let me just write the analog, see the exercises for the formal statement. Uh, P equals analog of VCG payments. Then XP is a dominant strategy and Senate compatible mechanism. Again, uh, I'm, so we have not actually talked about randomized mechanisms at any previous point in this class or last quarter, I don't think. So what do I mean by this? I just mean that, um, you know, for all i, for all v minus i, uh, for all vi and for all misreports, okay, let me just say, uh, let me write it this way. Expected utility of i, where the expectation is over the random coin flips of the mechanism, always maximized by truthful reporting, no matter what v minus i is. Okay, so if we extend bidder's utility functions over distributions by linearity, assuming they're risk neutral, uh, then we're just saying that for those um, extended utility functions, truth for reporting should be a dominant strategy. This is tantamount to assuming that uh, bidders are risk neutral. Okay, and that's what, we're, that's what we're gonna assume for randomized mechanisms whenever we talk about them in this class. Isn't that trivial when we're measuring things in utility anyway? Um, you know, it kind of depends on, uh, you know, like, so when you talk about utility functions, I mean, there's, I mean, there's, there's layers of assumptions, right? I mean, so, you know, it's one thing to assume some kind of cons consistency or coherency about how people compare deterministic outcomes, and then it's sort of a strictly stronger assumption about how that extends to their comparisons over lotteries, right? So, like, I mean, just think about money itself, right? So, like, we're assuming that you like 100 bucks more than zero bucks, right? What are, you know, and that, assume, that, you know, that alone doesn't imply anything logically about, you know, how you feel about 50 bucks with certainty versus how you feel about zero, 100, 50, 50, right? I mean. So that's coded into talking about my, value, my valuation for 50. I mean, that ignore, that assumes like you're risk neutral, right? That's but I mean, if we, because the, the I should be measured on the, on the utility scale or not on, 
not on a dollar scale. No, so the quasilinear assumption is sort of saying the V's are on a dollar scale. That's kind of, that's more the implicit assumption that we've been talking about. Because right, I'm doing things like adding up the values for different players and saying maximizing this has some meaning. So, where, I mean, so, uh, you know, the, there's different interpretations, but certainly like the most straightforward interpretation of all of this welfare maximization problem is just cardinal utilities. So that there is some, meet, there is some comparison between the two. Yeah. But anyway, so, so, I mean, this is an interesting topic, this idea of risk neutral and what else could you do and, you know, how does it change mechanism design to vary that assumption? All that's interesting. It would have a good place in a class called Frontiers of Mechanism Design. That said, we're not going to do it. Okay. So uh, we're going to have enough, uh, our job will be hard enough even with a risk neutral, neutral assumption. So, but, uh, but good comments, good comments. Okay. So um, pretty much all multi-parameter, there, there's some minor exceptions, but you know, to first order, all positive approximation mechanisms that are DSIC uh, are MIDR mechanisms. That's the state of the art, okay? So really, we kind of don't know how to design DSIC multi-parameter mechanisms except via this regime, okay? And uh, nice open, you know, it would be great to see some progress that either uh, adds some, you know, fundamentally, you know, you know, different tools to the mechanism design toolbox, or failing that proves in a formal sense that there's nothing else you can do. Both of those seem very difficult, but progress would be kind of celebrated in either direction, frankly. Okay. So the focus on, on the rest of today and on next week is just going to be, you know, given that our design space seems so limited, let's start getting really creative within that design space and see what we can do. Okay, so that's going to be the flavor. Uh, the, so the, the theme for the next couple lectures is it's kind of amazing what you can do with these mechanisms for suitably defined distributions. Okay. All right. Cool. So the last thing I want to do today in the remaining time is I want to introduce you to a scenario where we can actually get some very strong positive results. And we can get strong positive results using an MIDR mechanism that builds on some of the linear programming machinery we've already built up. Okay. And so today we'll only have time to just talk about the algorithmic problem. Uh, we'll have to postpone incentive issues till next week. So here's the deal. We've got non-identical items, M of them. So the new twist for scenario eight is we're going to have a healthy supply of each of the items. Okay, we're going to call it K. And so normally K has been equal to one, but now K is going to be bigger. And the problem is going to get easier the bigger K is, the more copies we have. So in total, it's going to be K times M items. M classes, within each class, K copies. Now, a bit evaluation is going to be a hybrid of unit demand in general. Okay, so for a given type, for a given item, I don't want more than one copy. So k different people are going to be given the k copies of a given item. But amongst the m different items, I have totally arbitrary valuations. Monotone as usual, but other than that, I don't care at all. It doesn't have to be submodular, anything like that. So bitter i has an arbitrary monotone valuation. VI 2 to the U. So notice U is just the set of items, or the types of items. Okay? And then we have K copies of each. So the valuations are defined only on, only on the different types of items. So for example, if K was N, this would clearly be a trivial problem. Right, I could just give each bidder its favorite bundle, there'd be no contention. I could just charge price zero. Okay? K equal one would be the most general valuation model we've seen thus far in the course. Okay? 
So the question is, you know, maybe this problem uh, becomes reasonably tractable from modest values of k, and that is in fact the case. And that's sort of a nice kind of a uh, positive result from the, from the literature here. All right, so here's the theorem we're going to prove. Uh, and again, so this algorithm, so we're just going to study the, the purely algorithmic question, maximizing welfare. The algorithm that I'm going to show you won't directly lead to a mechanism, but with reasonably minimal massaging, it will be an algorithm that we can embed in this MIDR framework. But for today, just an algorithm. So we show that logarithmic supply is sufficient for a really good approximation. Okay. So for some constant c, as long as k is at least c times log m, m is the number of distinct items, over epsilon squared, then we can get a 1 minus epsilon approximation. I forgot to say what the model is. So here we're assuming black box valuations that support demand and value queries. And the algorithm that we'll give, the running time plus the number of queries will be poly in all of the relevant parameters. Okay? So that's what I want to show you in the rest of the time today. The problem's clear? All right. So we're going to build on the linear programs we discussed, uh, I guess, last week. Now, in this case, so remember, uh, when we're talking about linear programs, we're mostly using them to characterize while rising equilibria and relate them to exactness of linear programming relaxations. Um, today, we're actually, so in this case, the valuations are general, so we're not going to have while rising equilibria, we're not going to have exact linear programming relaxations, but we're still going to use them in an algorithm. We're going to solve one, it's not going to be integer, it's going to be fractional, but we'll round it to an integer solution which is almost as good as the fractional one. Okay. So we're going to do, use something called randomized rounding. And what, why rounding? Well, we're going to solve a linear program and we're going to get fractions, things strictly between 0 and 1. And we want to make them zeros and ones. So that's the rounding. Let me remind you the relevant linear program. <laughs> so then we had an integer program which exactly uh, captured welfare maximization, and then we drop the integrality constraints to linear con non negativity constraints to get the following linear program. The objective function is just to maximize the welfare. So let me remind you we have a decision variable xis for each bitter i and bundle s. The semantics is this should be 1 if s is the bundle that i gets in an allocation, 0 otherwise. The welfare overall. We just sum over the bidders, we sum over the bundles that they might get, and then we pick up the value for whatever bundle they do get, whenever that's one. So what are the constraints? Well, we have a constraint per good. Now, previously we said that a good should only be allocated once. Now we have k copies. So now the linear program is going to be, for each good, the total number of times we allocate it should be at most k. How many times do we allocate it? Well, we sum over the bidders. We sum over all of the bundles that include the item J. And that sum over all I's and relevant S's should be bounded by K. Then we have the usual constraint that each bidder should only get to one bundle. And then we have the non-negativity constraints replacing the previous integrality constraints.
Now, I did some hard work last week when we were proving that uh, we could maximize welfare for gross substitutes valuations. One thing we proved along the way is that we can actually solve this linear program in polynomial time, given demand queries. Okay. We actually had two, two parts of that proof. First, we showed we could solve the problem in linear, uh, the linear program in polynomial time. We actually never used the gross substitutes hypothesis in that part of the argument. Okay. All we did was pass to the dual, look at the separation oracle, notice that the separation oracle was exactly a demand query. We assumed that we had efficient demand queries, so we were done. We used the gross substitutes hypothesis when we then concluded that, oh, well, fortunately, we only had to solve a linear program, but its answer is the same as the integer program that we care about. That's where we use gross substitutes, and that's what's not true now. Okay? So, so, a couple things. So first of all, in any case, the optimal, the optimal value of this linear program is certainly an upper bound on the max welfare possible for an allocation. We're searching only over more stuff. The maximum's only bigger. So the LP opt is at least the max welfare. So it's a yardstick against which we can compare the welfare of our own allocations. And recall ellipsoid plus demand queries. We can solve this linear program in polynomial time. Okay. So that's going to be the first step in our algorithm. Okay, it's polynomial in the same sense here. Okay, queries, uh, number of queries in polynomial and all the relevant parameters. So the first step of the algorithm is to do that. And I'm going to denote by x star be the optimal solution. And again, there's no gross substitutes condition, so there's no reason to think that this will be anything other than fractional. Okay. So in other words, this is not directly useful for us. This is going to say something like, you know, bidder one, uh, give them like, you know, 10% of the pair of goods one and two. Give them 20% of the goods two and three, etc., etc. What do we do with that one, right? So, the question is, how do we round these x stars will bona fide integer allocation. Okay, and can we do it in a way that we can prove that the welfare of that allocation is almost optimal? How many of you have seen randomized linear programming routing before? Most of you. Okay, so it's a very natural idea, cool idea, by Raghavan and Thompson. So here's the key observation. So zoom in on some bidder, say bidder number one. Okay. So we have in our hand some feasible solution to this linear program. So for bidder number one, we have these x1s's, okay, that sum to at most one. So the observation is we can think of this as a probability distribution over bundles s. If this, this sums to strictly less than one, just think of the rest of the probabilities being on the empty set. Okay? So this is just, and they're all non-negative. Okay? So that's a probability distribution. Let's just sample from it. That's going to give us some bundle. Okay? A given bundle with probability proportional or equal to whatever that x star i s is. And we can do that independently for each i. All right, so given this fractional solution, I'm giving you a randomized algorithm that outputs some hopeful, hopefully, some allocation. And so the randomized algorithm does the following. For each bidder i, independently, it assigns the items s to bidder i with probability x star i s. Actually, for feasibility reasons, feasibility reasons, let me scale down the probability a little bit. I'll multiply it by 1 minus epsilon. So there's going to be some probability left over. That all goes to the empty bundle. Okay. Is it clear what I mean? So from the LP, you know, it was 60, 40, this bundle or this bundle. I make them, you know, 
roughly 59 and 39 flip a coin. Those are the properties that get those bundles with 2%, they get the empty stuff. All right, so what properties does this have? So in the analysis, we need to do two things. So the first thing we need to do is look at the objective function value. That's basically by linearity, not a big deal. The second thing we need to understand is feasibility. Okay, Because the thing to realize about this randomized algorithm is it's making random choices in a totally uncoupled way across the bidders. Right? We have n bidders, we have k copies of an item, k might be way less than n. Okay? Sure, in some sense, the expected value, the expected amount of times you expect to sell a good isn't too much, but you know, we all know things can deviate from the expectation. So analysis. Okay, so first, what are the ramifications of the rounding on the objective function value? How does that change when we pass from the fractional solution to this randomized integer solution? Well, so let's look at the expected welfare of the allocation produced by our algorithm. This expectation is only over the coin flips in this randomized rounding algorithm. So by linearity of expectation, we can just look at the expected contribution of each bidder separately. And for a given bidder i, we can just expand its expectation. We can just say, well, you know, i contributes vis to the welfare of the allocation in the event, let's say vi of si, in the event, um, sorry, just give me another sum here. In the event that s happens to be the, exactly the items that get assigned to it. Well, by definition, our randomized rounding algorithm, this is exactly the LP solution value, x star is, scale multiplied by 1 minus epsilon. So this is just exactly equal to 1 minus epsilon, i, s, v, i, s, x star i, s. This was the optimal solution value of our linear program as a relaxation. That, of course, is an upper bound on the biggest welfare of any integer allocation. So this is at least opt. The upshot being that we run this very simple randomized rounding algorithm, we feel pretty good about the welfare of what results. Okay? On average, it's going to be within 1 minus epsilon of something which is probably bigger than the best integer solution. Okay? So that's good. Objective function, that's, what, that's the point here. Objective function and expectation is good. So what about, so what about uh, feasibility, though? This is the problem. And so again, um, right. So let's 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 understand this in a little more detail. So think about some item J. Say the first item. So what are the relevant random variables uh, as we do this randomized rounding? Well, let X I J be the indicator random variable about whether bidder I gets a copy of J or not. Notice that no bidder will ever get more than one copy of uh, item J. And that's because just all of the S's in this linear program represent bundles with the most one copy from each item, because nobody wants more than one copy. Okay. So the sum, so for a given J, the sum of the XIJs is just the number of copies of J that get sold. Okay? And we only have K copies, so we're really hoping that's going to be the most K. Okay, so then. So an expectation were certainly good by a similar argument as for the objective function, just by linearity. So this again is for a fixed item J. So if we look at the total amount of copies that might get sold, again by linearity of expectation, we just look at the uh, expected number that gets sold to J. J can be sold to I in any number of different ways, any bundle S that includes J. So this is just over bundles S, for which J is a member. Probability that I gets S, and again by a randomized rounding, 
If we know this is exactly x star i s times 1 minus epsilon, giving us 1 minus epsilon, sum over i, sum over s, j and s, x star i s. And x star is a feasible linear programming solution, so at least for the fractional solution, we know that in fractional terms, j is not oversold, only k copies are sold. Okay. So at most, 1 minus epsilon times k. All right, but that's really not good enough. Okay, so we really want a feasible solution. Okay, we just we don't want an expectation every good is not oversold. We really want every good to not be oversold. We want a bona fide allocation. So uh, we just have to apply large deviation bounds. So who who uh, who's seen turnoff bounds before? Wow, excellent. Okay, hundred percent. That, that, that warms the heart, I've got to tell you. All right, so uh, let me not even write down. Let me just, uh, so I'm going to use the turnoff bound of the form. Um, let's see, so the probability that, okay, so here are the YLs. These are independent, bounded in 0, 1. Namely, these X, I, J's here, which are indicators. So the probability that this exceeds its mean by more than 1 plus delta, here mu here is just the uh, expectation of the sum, which we just computed to be less than minus epsilon times k. Uh, so, do, 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 do. Right. so the turnoff bound here is of this form. As you all probably know, the really important property of the turnoff bound is that it's, this probability is uh, decreasing exponentially quickly in the mean. Okay. So mu is the mean. This is what you're expect. This is what you're expecting to see, and we want to basically say, okay, if the realization is not you know more than one percent or something, more than the expectation. So delta is here some small constant. We want this to be inverse polynomial. That's going to happen once mu is logarithmic, right? So you know many of you probably when I first wrote down k equals omega of log m over epsilon squared, you know maybe some of you even already sort of had this in mind. Okay, but that's where it is. So the, the log gamut, the problem outset, is exactly this mu in this turnoff bound. Yeah, that's exactly where it is, where it comes from. Okay, so for us, so apply here. What do we get? We get the probability. So given that the expected number of copies of J that are sold is 1 minus epsilon times K, the probability that it's oversold. Um, is going to be, so just plugging in these things here, so mu, we can think of as k, delta is going to be epsilon over 1 minus epsilon squared, and so this is going to be inverse poly, okay, inverse poly in what? So this is just for one fixed item, okay, we want this to be true for all items, so there's a union bound over the items on the horizon, so that's m, so it's inverse poly in m that we want this to be. So it's going to be uh, 1 over m to the c, where c is a constant, um, provided, let's see, so this is basically the epsilon squared, that we, so we want to basically kill the epsilon squared and have a log m left. So that's why we have this log m over epsilon squared. As we jack up the hidden constant in the omega notation, that jacks up this power down here. Okay, so that's just plugging in. Now with the union bound, so upshot, so this is by a union bound over the items, we are feasible with probability at least one minus one over m to the c minus one. Okay. Does anyone want more, de more details there? Is that too fast? Makes sense. So what did we learn? So in a given trial of randomized rounding, so basically, imagine we do a polynomial number of trials of randomized rounding. Okay, we, we solve the LP once, okay? but now we just keep doing randomized rounding. Okay. Basically, we're never going to see an infeasible solution. That's what this tells us. Right? Everything will be feasible. 
each of these trials, which is independent, the expected objective function value is really good within 1 minus epsilon, not just of the integer optimum, but even of the LP optimum. Okay. So eventually, within a polynomial number of trials, we're going to see a solution that's both feasible and has objective function value almost as high as this expectation, just by a markup and quality argument. Okay. So, so in a poly number of randomized rounding trials, get a solution, let's say get an output. And I, you know, I'm not doing this super formally, but you know, all the details are straightforward. They're just exactly what you expect them to be. So which is feasible. And again, that means just every good is sold k times at most. And two, the welfare. So I need a little bit of slack. So instead of 1 minus epsilon, let's say 1 minus 2 epsilon. I get this for the markup inequality, which I'm suppressing. Uh, times the... So I'm going to write the stronger statement. Believe it or not, we're actually going to use the stronger statement next week. So we're within 1 minus 2 epsilon of the LP solution, which of course applies in particular that we're within 1 minus 2 epsilon of the max welfare. Okay. Just by taking the best of all the randomized round trials. Okay. So we're feasible, we're almost as good as the fractional solution. So this is a very minor sort of weakening of the guarantee we had for gross substitutes. For gross substitutes, we just said solve the LP, you'll get an integer solution. Okay, no loss at all, 100% of optimal. Here, you know, generally you won't. You, I mean, it's not true that you'll generally get an integer solution, even if you have this many copies. But you can round it to one, losing almost nothing. Okay, so the LP value simply will not be much bigger than any integer value, an optimal integer value. Okay. So this solves the algorithmic question in a very satisfying way. Okay, this is still an NP-hard problem. I guess I didn't prove that to you, but it is. But we can get within 1 minus epsilon for even a <coughs> modest logarithmic number of copies of the goods. Sorry, so I definitely don't want to, don't feel like I need to see the proof right now yeah. of this, but I'm just trying to understand what the formal statement is, because, uh, so you still have some vanishingly small, exponentially small probability of failure. Okay, so that, yes, that's right. So, so it is a randomized algorithm. algorithm. Right, so... So what do you mean by in a polynomial number of rounds you'll have a feasible allocation? So sorry, you're right. So I should, I should you're absolutely right. Uh, with high probability, this should all be with high probability. And this should also be then with high probability you can get that. So you're right. I mean, it's a, it's a Monte Carlo algorithm. Monte Carlo algorithm. It can be de-randomized. Um, I'm not going to do any of that in class. I'll try to put some citations in the notes. But if you want, there are methods, so-called pessimistic estimators, at the very least, with the work that you can use to de-randomize these algorithms with the same guarantee. So we've solved the approximation question. Next week, we'll massage this algorithm a little bit so that it becomes MIDR, which will give us the DSIC guarantee for scenario number eight.